Hi everyone, it's Jai for a 5 2 back again in Say the Land of Cosplay, rummaging around and seeing what we can find on Inside Cosplay. Joining me this week is my very special guest, the one and only Matt Auckland. Hi Matt, how are you today? I'm very well, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. I've been enjoying this amazing heat over in the UK and I think we're in the final of the World Cup. So good luck yes. to all the teams that are playing and we hope you all have a wonderful time. But we're not here to talk about sports, we're here to talk about cosplay. So my first question to you, Matt, is when did you first start cosplaying? I would have started, I guess it would have been four years ago uh, in May, the May that just went by. Um, I would have started uh, with my first full complete costume as Superman. Not to say I hadn't tried to make some before then, but Superman was the first one I was able to finish. Uh, to, to the end. Awesome. Uh, what were some of the cosplays that you tried to make prior to Superman? Um, well, uh, I had tried to make my own Batman mask. Mm -hmm. um, it, so I was, I made a, a plaster mold of my own head and I sculpted the clay on the, the plaster mold and that took a while to get it the way I wanted. Uh, once I finally had that done, I was ready to uh, to cast it. So I did, uh, if, if you can imagine from the side, it was kind of like a clay retaining wall. Mm -hmm. And I put the plaster on the front of the, the Batman mask and then on the back. Um, and I let that cure. And when I went to separate it, um, instead of separating nicely, it was locked. So I ended up splitting the mold and in the process destroying the... Uh, the clay sculpture, so I, I, uh, I was kind of upset about that. So I, I put Batman on the back burner, and I went to Superman instead. Um, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people know you from being Superman at most events and such likes. Um, but my next question for you is: Who or what inspired you to get into cosplay? It started as, uh, while I was living in Toronto for a few years, um, one of my friends up there uh, was doing busking as Batman. He was uh, the Toronto Batman. I knew him up there. Um, and I started chatting with him, and I, I mentioned to him that I would like to do it as well um, after failing with my Batman mask. Um, and then I decided right after Man of Steel came out, um, that after seeing it four or five times in theaters uh, that I would like to try to make that costume. And that's kind of where that started. I wanted to um, be able to do that and then visit some of the, uh, the children's hospitals in Toronto. I ended up moving away from Toronto, but I did finish the costume and that's kind of along the lines of the stuff I do now when I'm not at conventions. So um, yeah, I really like that part of it. Is there any particular... Um cosplay, like, I really hate using this term, but cosplay personalities that inspired you to do um, essentially up your kind of level when it comes to cosplay? Um, nobody specific, and the reason is uh, because each time I do seek out a new costume or a new character to do, uh, before I do any work on it myself, I, I, I go out and I look for the people who I feel have done it the best already. Um, so per costume, it could be three or four different people um, based on the character or whoever it might be. Um, specific people, I, I wouldn't be able to put it to one person really. There, there's a lot of people for each project that uh, I take a lot of inspiration from just in the work I do, I guess. Um, it, let's say, for instance, like you can mention there about um, you look to see who's done it the best in terms of cosplayers. Um, we'll take the Witcher uh, character as an example. I, I apologize to the Witcher fans. I have not played the game series. I haven't really followed it, so I don't know the characters' names. But the character, the lead character that you cosplayed as, who? specifically did you look for or look at when it came to you kind of putting together the costume like who would be the inspiration behind that what cosplayers 
Yeah, uh, for sure. For uh, for Geralt uh, from The Witcher, I mostly was looking towards um, mall cosplay. Um, he does probably the definitive Witcher cosplay out there, uh, and a few others. He he does fantastic work uh, up in his studio. Um, so I was looking at a lot of his references. Um, he hadn't done the specific costume I was looking at, so I looked for him more uh, for like the wig and the makeup. Um, as far as the costume itself, uh, I, I didn't catch any of their names, but it was it was a lot of Pinterest looking uh, to try to figure out what they did. Um, and then one of my my friends uh, locally, uh, Matt Belfontaine, he helped me a lot with the chainmail. Um, cause that was kind of, uh, uh, boggling me a little bit. So I, I got a lot of help from him with the chain mail por- portion, of, uh, portion of it. It's something that a lot of cosplayers who have that little bit of metal work incorporated, incorporated into their costume, um, always say that they kind of struggle with. And mm. I've actually known a few people who, um, are making their own chain mail. And, and it's not for anything in particular, it's just something that they wanted to try and, and yeah. to do. And they always come to me and they always say, oh my gosh, this is so hard. Like, you have no idea how hard it is. And I'm like, I actually do. <laughs> <laughs> um, sitting here with X amount of costumes behind me, hmm, yeah, I have no idea how hard making chain mail is. Oh God, no. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, I think that is the worst thing that, like, an, any person who's trying something new for the first time in terms of, like, chain mail or a costume of some description can say to a cosplayer, you have no idea how hard making this particular thing is. It's like, yeah, we have no idea how hard it is. Yeah, maybe, maybe a little idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what... To date, what has been the most challenging cosplay that you've done, both from the making of the costume as well as the acting side of it? Because there is a little bit of acting involved in cosplay, whether that be how a character might speak, how they might move, um, how they might even pose, or just generally how they might interact with another member of the public. So let's talk about the costume side first, because we've kind of kept it kind of caution central up until now so what has been the most challenging one to date that you've done um i would say the uh i, I would say it's a tie between two mm-hmm. um the first one which kind of edges out a little bit is the witcher costume only because it had a lot of um, leather work and chainmail work, which is something I hadn't used before, and it was all kind of real material. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of figuring out a lot of that, I, I would say that was probably the hardest. Um, the second hardest uh, would probably be the armored Batman from Batman v Superman. I did yeah. only because of the time limit I put on myself and the fact that the movie wasn't out yet. So the only picture I had to go by was. Uh, the picture of the suit in the glass display at at a convention, um, and I decided to do that costume in only a couple of weeks. Um, so I had to kind of create everything from scratch. And there's things I'd go back and fix because it's not accurate at all. But I, I, I really liked it at the time. Um, I'm actually going to comment on your armored Batman scenario. I had a very similar scenario because. Um, my first ever cosplay was a gender bent Harley Quinn, and mm-hmm. it was her classic kind of um, jumpsuit look. And right. I remember thinking, right, people now know me as that character, you know, so I have to update the look. And we heard about the Suicide Squad movie, mm-hmm. um, and we knew that Harley Quinn was going to be one of those characters. And I was going to a con just as we'd been told that like a few things about it like what the costumes were going to look like a little we had um i think it, we were told that harley was going to wear a kind of white t-shirt that had something to do with daddy's like daddy's little monster on it and then various other tidbits um like she was supposed to have a 
like her jacket but we weren't told how long it was so right. knowing all this I incorporated a little bit of what I thought the costume was going to look like and it was really really scary because like I tore up uh, a plain t-shirt and just put daddy's little anarchist on it and um, ripped up another t-shirt and used that as like a little jacket Yeah. and went along with black trousers and my hammer and that was me um, and I remember the week after I was done with them, no it wasn't the week, it was the day after they actually brought out pictures of what Margot Robbie was going to look like and I was like if only I had fabric paint and I could have painted the t-shirt at the top yes. that would have been so <laughs> awesome but luckily I got to redo that costume and I brought it closer to what um, Margot Robbie's look was like in the film and people love it so yeah absolutely um, so yeah like people really enjoyed that particular incarnation that I did and there we go um, so let's move on to the acting side. Today, who or what has been the most challenging cosplay for you from an acting standpoint? I would say um, both, actually, it probably takes the spot for both easiest and most challenging, and that would be uh, when I'm portraying Superman. Only because, um, I mean, I mean, it comes easy. It's something I do al almost every other weekend, um, the, the different charity events and, and what have you that we do. Um, and so I've, I've, I've now been Superman for almost, well, over four years. Um, so it, come, it comes natural. But that being said, it does get difficult when you have to try to find a Superman-like way to explain why you're not going to fly at the moment. Um, yeah, a, a common question that you get from kids is, well, okay, if you're Superman, then why don't you fly? And it's like, well, I, I can't because of this reason or, or this or whatever. If I do it now, it's coming up with stuff like that. The, and questions you can't even imagine that the minds of children dream up. It's replying to those and staying in character while you do it is probably the hardest part um, of, of being Superman. But I mean, I... I love it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't change it. I think I might have a slight um, out for you on that one. Um, I don't know whether or not you do this when you're doing the charity events, but some people I've known always have a handler nearby, mm -hmm. like just in case there's anything that they need while in costume. Um, and if you can get one of these, I would get like. Um, healing there's like these healing crystals that you get right um that sometimes come with jewelry so i would get one of them and just take the jewelry off of it and paint it green so that you have yeah. like yeah a piece of kryptonite and you can if a child asks you can say well i can't because kryptonite yeah absolutely it's, oh it's yeah i've, I've kind of come back to that a, a few times it's it depends on how young the kids are there's a certain age where they want to try to catch you in in the lie, but there's a certain age below that where they want to believe it. So you can kind of tell to those kids, you know, it's um, I, I, I'm, I'm weak right now. There must be kryptonite nearby. Can you go find it for me? And they'll run off and, and search for it. And they won't find it, obviously, because it's not there. But that's kind of I've kind of come back to that a few times. Or if we're doing an indoor event, you know, I can't because last time I, I broke the window or, or, or <laughs> stuff. <like that>. so, <laughs> All right. Um, so my next question for you is very similar to the last one. In your opinion, what is the most difficult thing or character to cosplay as, both from the making of the costume and the acting side? And we'll put this in both regards to what you feel is difficult and what you think might be difficult for somebody just starting out in cosplay. So let's start with yourself on the acting side like what is one thing that you would look at and go mm, I might need to study or read up on the character or creature before I really jump into it right um, for for me um, when I choose a character that I want to be uh, portraying in a costume sense 
it's usually for me it's usually somebody i've identified with in some way or the main character of a game or a movie um so there's there's a lot of stuff to draw from so beforehand i think doing a lot of research whether it be replaying the game or uh watching the movies again uh, those kind of things help a lot it, it's it, it's always been somewhat easy for me to pick up on mannerisms and behaviors um i, I find myself doing it in real life too to the annoyance of my coworkers often but um it's it, it's never been overly hard uh for myself unless i get caught in a situation where i'm i'm given a question that trips me up um i i think for me i think the hardest part of it is um that i like making people laugh i like joking around so when i get a character that's supposed to be more serious i have a hard time not making the joke when it it pops into my head or 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 that kind of thing um is that something so you find it's... is that something you find difficult when you're doing superman cuz it I... is, um yeah i i can i can joke around a little bit as as superman but it has to be more of like a a lighthearted down to earth humor i can't make um I don't know. I I can't even think of a joke, but I wouldn't be able to do like a like a, you know, that's what she said joke as Superman because it's not it's not in character. So I I want to make people laugh, so I feel the joke and it 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 wants to come out, but I'm like, you know, maybe maybe not right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um okay, so obviously that is something that can be a bit of a yeah when it comes to doing the acting side, what about the creation of the costume? What is something that you would look at and go, oh, I don't have blank skill set there, you know, um, or I'm not quite sure how I would pull that off. Is, Is there anything that you do look at and just go, I need more time before I can debut that particular character or costume? Oh, absolutely. Um, anything, uh, anything that would serve better as being three um, D printed, um, which I've I've spoken out about before, but more from like a a jealousy standpoint, I guess. Um, totally it got misconstrued. A little bit. Yeah, it got it got misconstrued a little bit as I hate all three D printed things, and that's that's not it at all. Um, but any anything that should look just as clean as if it came out of a 3D printer, those kind of things I'm not ready for from a financial standpoint. Um, and anything that has moving parts, uh, so you'll see like Iron Man cosplayers, and they've got like the mask that lifts up automatically, and, and thing, things like that. Uh, electronics are are beyond at the moment. So for for now, any armor stuff, I stick to foam. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I was doing a, a very small Comic Con, uh, like a local town kind of Comic Con kind of thing, and we were getting ready to do the masquerade, and I was dressed as L from Death Note, and nice. I got such a great reaction from that, and I really wasn't expecting the reaction that I got. Um, but I remember waiting to go up on stage. And there was an Iron Man and a mech suit in front of me. And this is like heavy metal kind of stuff. Um, there was LEDs on the guy. And I actually remember before going up on stage, um, I was looking at his costume and I was like, I really love your costume. Like, where did you make it yourself? Did you buy it? Um, and there was parts of his LEDs like sticking out of his arm and I was like, oh right, hold on, before you go up on stage I'm tucking in his LEDs and pulling the plate over it. Um, but as we were waiting to go up, I let him obviously go in front of me because it was a very narrow staircase. Um, and I said to him, look, I know that you're going to have issues getting up these stairs, but if you fall backwards, I'm not going to break your fall. You know, like, <laughs> I, I am skin and bones, so you'd rather have somebody else standing behind you than me, because just, yeah. I will not break your fall at all. Yeah, understandable. Um, 
and, and to be fair, it was kind of a weird scenario seeing a, a, like myself standing there, white t-shirt, black hair, jeans, death note in hand, saying, I'm not going to break your folds. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I might as well just write your name here right now, you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, that, that in and of itself always really amazes me seeing these kind of like metal type costumes and you just think, wow. And at the yeah. same time, you feel for the same people as well, because like when you see these Iron Man type people that do have the mix it and they pop the helmet, the sweat that is just running oh, off yeah. them. Like, yep. I'm going to say right now, guys, if you do do things like that, kudos to you. But please stay hydrated throughout your day because you will lose so much body water. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Um, okay. So let's flip this question on its side and put it in regards to other people. Um, what do you feel from a costume standpoint of view would be something rather difficult for a new cosplayer to do, um, not necessarily something you would advise them against doing, just something that you'd say, okay, maybe practice this before you actually do it at a convention. Yeah. Um, I, it's, it's going to be a little cliche, but I would say, honestly, um, being happy with the final product, um, you know, it's it, it's not easy for everybody to create things uh, with their hands. However, um, I feel that anything you have created, whether you're just starting out or you've been at it for 15 years, um, it, that's something to be proud of. And, and especially if you're wearing it at a convention, you're meant to have a good time. Your friends are there. Be proud of what you've done because if if you're not and you're not having fun doing it, then what's the point? I mean, it's, you're always going to improve. I look back at stuff I've done and I haven't been doing it that long and I, I hate them. I throw them out, but in the moment, absolutely. I was proud of them. Um, I mean, if there was one piece of advice I could give, it would be, and I mean, we're all guilty of it. It's don't wait until the last minute to start. If you've got the idea, start it now, piece by piece. Work on it over a period of time, um, because funny, it's funny you yeah. should say that. Because um, I was just speaking to a couple of members of my family earlier tonight, um, because I'm hoping to go to a convention in Edinburgh, um, which is in Scotland. For those of you who don't know, well, it's Scotland, England, close enough. Of thing um i think it like borders like it's still within scotland but it borders england I'm not really sure um but there's a convention happening there in november and i really want to go to it but there's i want to do more than just one day because so far i've only been able to do one day at whatever convention i go to um and I'd like to do two days over this and do two different costumes over those two days. And even though I've got like one costume practically done, there's maybe only one or two things I need to get for it um, or even do to it. There's another costume that I want to start. And I was contacting a family member tonight saying, hey, are you going to my granddad's tomorrow because I need you to buy stuff off the internet for me? <laughs> so you can totally tell that m my methodology is kind of like working. It's like I have to get this, this, and this pieces of material before I can even get to the next month. You know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I always say, give yourself as much time as you possibly can. And I, I'll throw my hands up and say I've been guilty of it as well. I spent. I think I was due to go to a con um, at one point and I was working on dyeing a wig 
and that's not easy to do you know it's not easy to do when it's a synthetic hair like exactly. you have to do very specific things to synthetic hair um, and I spent probably the week before giving it its first coat and then the night before giving it its like second and third coat yeah. And I was just like, this is not enough time, man. It's not enough yeah. time. Oh, no. I do it every single time. And I, I kick myself and I say each time is going to be the last time. And then next thing you know, it's night before and I'm working on stuff again. So, yeah. Um, okay. So in regards to how a character might act. So let's say um, I come to you. I say, Matt. I have the most perfect costume here. It's um, one of Nightwing. We'll just use Nightwing as an example. Um, and it's exactly how Nightwing looks. It is um, amazingly done, but I'm not quite sure how to act the character or be that character. What would you advise me to do? Um, I, I honestly, the I think the best thing would be um, to. I feel if you're going to do a costume, it should be somebody that you're interested in or something you like anyway. So there's obviously an interpretation or a few maybe um, that that you kind of have in your head as either the the real voice or when you're reading the comic you hear that person in your head um so for me if i was doing nightwing i would go back and i would watch um uh some of the just uh, the animated batmans um where i think i think neil patrick harris did nightwing um i would go back and watch animated series um after after he turns to Nightwing, there's there's a few different things I would go back, but for me that's what it would be. It would be, it'd be watching the interpretations that you love, um, and then finding little ways to emulate them, um, not duplicate them because you're never going to, but emulate so that what ends up happening in the end is a blend between the interpretation you love and yourself. So what you create together is now your version of Nightwing. Um, so it'll be, it'll be reminiscent of what you love, but it'll be unique to you as well. Okay. Um, I'm going to change this up a little bit. Now we use Nightwing as a really good example there. Um, what if somebody comes to you and says, Matt, I've got this amazing costume, um, all this character that is essentially mute or a creature that doesn't make many noises like say maybe a predator or xenomorph i know they make clicks and other kind of noises but essentially right. they don't verbally speak mm -hmm. well predator maybe but okay you get where <laughs> i'm going with this like we're going for yeah. characters that are mute essentially um what would you advise that person to do if they say okay i've got the most kick-ass costume here but i'm not quite sure how to portray this character would you give them right. a similar advice of just watch how the characters move or would you tell them something different? Uh, I mean, I guess it would depend on the character. Uh, for like um, a Predator or a Xenomorph, you could watch the source material. Again, uh, each one is portrayed a little bit differently based on the actor under the suit. Um, but in watching uh, some interviews and stuff with uh, Doug Jones, a very uh, uh, famous character, cre uh, creature actor, um, I, I believe he said it, it, it starts with um, a unique stance. Um, so, uh, you know, for the, if you were doing a xenomorph, it would be a little hunched over, um, kind of bug-like in your thinking. Um, whereas if you're doing a predator, it would be very like, uh, their movements were very slow and like they're, you know, they're when they go to take their mask off, all of their fingers move separately and like they're always like doing things very exaggerated and slow. So uh, starting off small and then expanding out, I guess, would be a good way to do it. Okay. Um, okay. So moving on, there are many different types of Comic-Cons that we can go to throughout the year. There is your 
big once a year ones, like I think specifically over in the States, you've got San Diego Comic Con, um, New York, I think yep. they do one as well, and mm -hmm. various ones over in Vancouver and all over the place. I think Florida does some Comic Cons as well. Hmm. <laughs> um, and then there's your not as like w big ones but they're kind of like medium sized and then there's obviously the smaller more local ones which out of those three do you prefer going to do you like the big ones the year ones the medium sized ones or the smaller local ones that can happen every so often or do you like a blend of the three well I'll make a confession. I've never actually been to a large convention. Um, the largest convention I guess I've been to uh, would be our local convention, which is it's uh, it's Halcon, um, which is probably the biggest one in the Atlantic Canadian provinces. Um, I think it's got well over eight thousand guests last year, or not guests, but attendees rather. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it. I, I, I would be probably a medium convention, I guess, if you were to put a, a label on it. But I, I've only been to that and small conventions. I've never made it out to a big one. Reason being is because I wouldn't want my convention experience to be similar to Disney, where in order to see somebody, you're spending your day waiting in a line. Um, I like the small closeness of the, the smaller conventions because it feels more like uh, we know a lot of the people that go, so it's like it's more like a small, or I guess a large family reunion where everywhere you look, you're seeing like your best friend, this person. You're you're able to go hang out with people. You've got time to do stuff. You can set up your own photo shoots at the convention. You've got the time for it. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, I would love, love, love to go to a large convention um, if I ever find the the money and the time. Um, but those would be similar to a Disney World thing, I think, for me, where it wouldn't be something I would do yearly. It'd be something I would do maybe once or twice per convention, mm -hmm. depending on the guests, I, 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 I think. I remember going to my first convention, and it's probably, like, in comparison to maybe Edinburgh, Edinburgh and London, a medium-sized convention as opposed to a really really small one um, but Robert England was there oh the, the amazing nice. Freddy Krueger um, yep. and they always do like the signings where you can go and meet the actors or they do this part where they bring them on stage and the actor will do a set for a little while um, I didn't necessarily want to go and see Robert England do his set. I was like, I've seen him at his table signing autographs. <laughs> it's good as far as I'm, I'm concerned. I have nothing against the guy. I just thought, he's having a full-on day. I'm having a full-on day. Let's not let them clash kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I remember wanting to go and sit down because I was really, really tired um, from being on my feet for, I think it was close to four hours at that point. So I was like heading up the aisle to try and get to a seat and an announcement came over the tannoid um, saying, welcoming to the stage, Robert, this massive crowd collective roar that sounded like a blood curdling scream erupted. And I kid you not, I jumped so high that I could have been clinging to the roof of the building that we were on. <laughs> like, I wasn't expecting it. It completely caught me out of midfield. And as soon as a guy kind of got in inland, not even in England, like the EN, it was just like the last of the guy's name. Yeah. I was like, oh, right. So that's why people are screaming. I actually thought somebody was being br brutally murdered. <laughs> you know? um, so I say to people who go to cons like that, be prepared for that kind of shit, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it is really, really cool getting to go and see some of the actors because uh, another, <clears throat> this is actually quite a funny one, another 
instance that I had was with Sean Aston. Yep. Uh, such a great guy. Um, I remember going around to see him and um, I said to the guys at iGameOnline.net that I would try and go and speak to Sean Aston because we were currently running a tabletop ser uh, session that was set in the world of the Lord of the Rings. And they were oh, like, cool. oh, like, please go and like say to him that we're doing this if you get time. And I'm like, I'll try my best. So mm -hmm. I got stopped by like one of the handlers and they're saying, I'm sorry, he's done for today. You'll need to come back tomorrow. Um, he's just, he's done for today. And I'm like, look, I'm not here for an autograph. I just want to tell him about a website, give him a business card and go home. I know he's mm -hmm. tired. I'm tired. I know he's hungry. I'm hungry. I know he probably wants to speak to his family. I want to go and shout at mine for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can I just please give him this card and go? I promise I'll just give him the card and leave. And the guy's like, no, nope, no, he's done. He's done. He's done. And he's obviously sitting at the table signing autographs for the following day. And he hears this like altercation. And I say to the, 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 the handler guy, look, can I just give you the card and you can give it to him and I can leave. And he's like, no, 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 I can't do that. I can't do that. And I'm like, don't be an asshole. You know? Yeah. Sean obviously overhears this and he, he calls me over and I'm like, eh, to the handler guy, just like, eh. Um, and I get up to Sean and I say, look, I know you're tired. I know you're probably wanting to get something to eat or go and speak to your family. I don't want to hold you up any longer than I already will. I just want to tell you about the website, give you this card. It would mean a lot to the guys if you had a listen. And he's like signing away as he's doing this and he can then stops for a moment, looks me up and down and then says to me, so what's your story then? And it didn't dawn on me I was still in costume until I looked down at myself and said, well, I'm what happens when Poison Ivy has a one night stand. <laughs> Excellent. Having been dressed as a gender bent Poison Ivy, I was just like, yep, that, that felt like the right thing to say at that moment in time. Fantastic. Um... So yeah, you, and I actually got a free autograph out of that, so... Nice. Always worth going to see celebrities, guys. You never know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I don't know whether that is considered a big con. It might be, but um, I would always recommend ta like testing the waters, guys. Like, go to as many cons as you can afford to go to. Like, the really small ones will only cost you... I don't know, one dollar or one pound, depending on what currency you use. You know, it doesn't cost much. 95% of that money does actually go to charity. So you're helping a charity in a sense. And that's always a really good thing to do. As Matt will tell you himself, having done uh, charity work with children in hospitals and such like, so it's always a really rewarding thing. Absolutely. Um, but on the subject of those big cons, have you ever been asked to, well, not the big ones, but cons in general, have you ever been asked to guest at them? And what was that like if you have? Uh, twice, yes. Um, I, I was asked to be a guest uh, at our local convention, HalCon, um, through the stuff that I did uh, with the volunteer uh, so I was making a guest appearance, not as a cosplay guest, but as what they call a local hero. So every year they choose a few uh, people from the community. Um, uh, and I say community, but it could be anywhere within uh, Nova Scotia's surrounding area um, to come and be a local hero. So people that stand out and have done something. So that I, I was that. And it was, I didn't have a table or, or anything like that. Um, I wasn't asked to host a panel, nothing, nothing like that. But um just being able to say that they thought of me enough to ask me to come be a part of what makes their convention great um 
it, it, it was nothing I asked for when I was when I started the charity stuff. It's just something that happened. So it 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 felt really really great for for somebody to want me as part of what they're offering to the public. Um, and then again, a second time, I was asked to be a guest at a much smaller convention, um, but one with just as much heart called Spring Equinox, and that was just this past uh, past spring, um, where I did have a table. Um, I had, had a little a little nameplate, um, and being able to you know see my name on something where people could come up and be like, "There's the name, there's the face," and make that connection. That that was really cool too. Awesome. Um, when you've been at maybe mediums, well, some of these conventions, have you ever been asked to be a judge for the cosplay competitions or is there called in the UK masquerades? Yes, uh, I've done that a few times, yep. And what was that like? Was it something that you felt was, obviously a lot of the people who do that and get asked to do that, they take it as a great honour that somebody has kind of like singled you, well, essentially singled you out and said you're the best in that particular field of cosplay, whether that be um, building armor or like fabric work or making props mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, what was that like for you? You know, like how how did you deal with that? Because I know it can be tremendously, um, like high pressure like because you'll see a lot of different costumes within that day and you'll be like oh i really like that one but this one's really really cool as well yeah oh it's it's such a cool experience um seeing people ranging from just starting out to um to being a few years into it to being several years into it and, and the varying degrees of what they're able to do um being able to both be inspired and 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 also uh, to give advice at the same time in the same environment is, is, is such a cool thing. That being said, it is one of the harder things I've had to do at a convention because you're simultaneously making somebody very happy and making several dozen people very unhappy. Um, each time I've done it, I've tried to let the people know who didn't place what a great job they've done. Um, and I've only ever given feedback when it's asked for because it's not my place to critique what they've done, um, only to uh, to kind of, for the sake of, of whatever convention I'm doing it for, to, to find the person or, or a couple people who are a, a bit above the others in that category, which I do um, with the help of whoever I'm with. Um, but it's, it, yeah, it's, it's at the same time, such a, a cool and humbling experience. And also one of the most difficult things I've done at a convention. Um, I've been, I, I don't know whether this is like unlucky or I just haven't been noticed yet, but I've never had the pleasure of doing that. And it is something that I would love to do one day and I really do hope that I get the opportunity to do it one day but at the same time I would find that the most nerve-wracking thing in the world as well because I've been at a couple of conventions and I've entered the competitions and I've been looking at all the other people in it and I'm looking at them and going oh my god your costume's like amazing you know, like, I've seen people dressed as a predator, I've seen people dressed as um, Green Arrow, I've seen people dressed as Iron Man, it, and you just think, oh my god, like, that year I was saying about um, meeting Sean Aston, I <clears> saw <throat> a baby who could not have been a month to two months old, and the mother had them dress up like a little hobbit. And yeah, the, the baby's costume was amazing looking, you know, and I was surprised that the baby hadn't spat up all over it, you know, it's like, oh, that's amazing, you know, the kids yeah. been really yeah, kind that's of great there. Um, and seeing certain kids in costume as well, I'm always really amazed at it. Um, 
Which brings me to my, ne my next question. When you're attending these events, what is the one thing that you're most excited for? And the one thing that you either used to or still kind of do on some level find the most nerve wracking? About the conventions? Yeah, about going to the conventions. Yeah, well, um, for me, um, the part I look forward to most is, again, it's like a big reunion of, of it's, it's like, it's like a high school reunion, but everybody you're going to see, you want to see, um, if, if that makes any sense. It's like, it's like an excuse for three days to go and have fun with your friends, be exactly who you want to be. Everybody knows that you're being your true self, and that is fantastic. Anybody can be who they want. It's just, it's, there's, there's nothing else like conventions that for me is by far the favorite, my favorite part. Um, and the, the most nerve wracking part is probably the days leading up to, cause uh, we were talking before about, uh, the dreaded con crunch and it's, I do it to myself every time. So, you know, when I'm, when I'm working up until the day before on a costume, I don't know if I'm going to step out onto that floor and it's going to fall apart. I don't know if I'm going to be able to sit down, if I'm going to be able to get it off to use the bathroom by myself, stuff like that is, uh, is probably the most nerve wracking part for me. I think um, a lot of cosplayers would agree with you on that. It's um, but another thing that they would also kind of mention as the d the debuting of a new cosplay. Like mm. I've known people who literally fall to pieces over debuting a new cosplay that they've got, and I don't know whether it's because they're known for another cosplay that they've done or whether it's like that thought that you're saying about like am I going to be able to sit down in this costume am I going to get there and is it going to fall apart and what mm -hmm. do I do if it does fall apart and you know you just have all of that running around inside your head and I think I'm one of the only few people who's debuted new costumes and not panicked about them like I I Maybe it's just my mentality and I just tend to think, well, if it falls apart, there's absolutely nothing I can do about it until I can get to a repair station or get to an area where I can repair it myself, you know, yeah. um, which if you have a repair station at your convention, guys, they are godsends. But if you don't, always make sure to pack yourself a little repair kit. Mm -hmm. um, those are also godsends um, but yeah I mean I would totally agree with that and say yeah it's it is one of the most amazing things because you get to see all those friends that you don't necessarily get to see throughout the year and the stuff with the costumes yeah that is scary um, we kind of mentioned about the cosplay competitions and masquerades, which are practically the same thing. Yep. Have you ever taken part in those yourself? And if so, did you win anything? I actually haven't. Um, I've never, I've never been in any of the costume contests or the masquerades, any, anything like that. Um, reason being is I, again, I'm at the convention to have fun. And I find that if I'm entering in a competition like that, it eats up too much of my day, and I'm not, uh, I'm not going to a convention to pay to stand around to wait to be judged, and then stand around to wait to go on stage, and then stand around to wait for everybody else to be done. So uh, for me, a costume contest is basically throwing away a whole day. Um, I, I'll, I'll go watch them. Absolutely, I'll go watch them, or if I'm asked, I will judge them, but unless I find something that I'm over the moon 1 million percent proud with and I think I've got a good chance of winning um, I, I don't think I will um, and I, I don't build my costumes with the idea of I'm gonna build this because I think it's gonna win a costume contest um, so I'm not building the biggest most impressive thing for that reason I'm building characters that I love that I want to be um, and, and I want them in turn to be a part of me after I'm done with them. So, awesome. Um, alrighty. So moving along, 
In your opinion, what is the best and the worst things that a new cosplayer can do when they're getting ready to go to a cosplay event or to a Comic Con in general? Best and worst. <laughs> best thing you can do would probably be to get enough sleep beforehand. You don't, I mean, working up until the day before, it's something we all do. But if you're so exhausted by the time the convention runs around that you don't have time or the energy to enjoy it, that's, it's, you're not going to have a great time. So I think uh, something you should not do before the convention is burn yourself out because you're going to want the energy to enjoy it while you're there. Um, Something that I think you should do, absolutely, uh, like you touched on earlier, is uh, is prepare yourself for things that could happen. So, you know, bring a mini hot glue gun, bring some glue sticks, bring, I don't know, duct tape, any, anything you think you might need, um, you know, a toothbrush, I, I don't know, whatever you think you might need uh, for the convention, because it, nothing, is, nothing is worse than being somewhere and saying man i should have brought that that's gonna throw a big wrench in part of my day um and to go along with that make sure you've got all of every piece of your costume because you don't want to forget you know the chest piece to your I've, your I've armor known, if <laughs> i've known people that have done that and they've traveled like really long ways like say they say they say like just outside of london and it takes like maybe two to three hours to get to where they're going and likewise I've known people who live in Scotland that have travelled to London to go to a convention and realised they've left a shoulder blade at home and it's like yep. no yep, I did that just a few weekends ago uh, we were driving uh, we were doing a four hour drive to Anna Maritime in New Brunswick and we got probably a third of the way there and uh, I got a text message from my roommates because my gun was still drying in the garage where I left it hanging. Uh, so luckily, we knew um, we knew some friends that were coming up the next day, so they were able to drive it up with them. So we ended up finding a solution that time. But that could have been that could have been bad. Yeah, exactly. That was a big. That was a big. Whew. Um, I've luckily not had that issue just yet, but. One issue that I did have, and this was my inexperience more so than anything else, um, and it was my first year cosplaying in general, um, I had my big mallet that I handcrafted right. myself, and I made it all out of cardboard, so it was completely con-friendly, but this was before we even had strict rules mm -hmm. at conventions, um, but parts of it like the two parts I had that would have like a funny face on one side and your face here on the other or whatever um, they kept like falling off oh no and I had to keep picking them up and I remember thinking as soon as I finished with the con for that day I went home and I said those are getting um, bleeping glued on yeah yeah, absolutely. And that's yeah. that, that, that's something I like to do before I go to a convention is I like to be able to do a test wear for a couple of hours of the costume, do some stress testing of things, because if it's going to fall off, I want it to fall off at home beforehand. So I'll put things through the ringer before I wear them just in case. The funny thing was my, my costume itself was perfect. Nothing fell off of that. It was just the prop. And yeah, exactly. It can That kind of taught me then in their I have to stress test even props. You know? Oh yeah. yeah. Um, which we will get into pretty soon actually. Um, is there anything else that you would advise people to do when going to a con? Is, is there something that they shouldn't do when they're getting ready to go to a con? Something they shouldn't do when they're getting ready to go to a con. Trying to think of anything I avoid doing. Um, I can't really think of anything that I avoid doing before going to a convention. There, it's because well, there's things that it's. I'll I'll help you out there. Um, I would say 
if you are a younger person, definitely tell somebody where you're going or go with a group of friends just in case anything happens. And yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. These things right here, like cell phones, absolute godsend, you know, if there's an emergency. Mm -hmm. You know, even for adults like myself and Matt, like, have a phone with you in case of emergency. Yes, yep. Or at least somebody nearby who has one. I mean, I mean, there's not a lot of places to hide a phone in Superman. Sometimes <laughs> I'll talk to you in the no. booth. But, uh, yeah, it, so as long as somebody nearby either has a pocket for it or, or something, that's that's also a good idea, yeah. That's another actually good thing to do. Um, if you're going to be in a, a suit that you know people are going to want like a lot of pictures of you, like I remember my, fir my first year with um, doing Harley, I got stopped every five steps oh, yeah. for, for photographs. And you got to plan your bathroom for 20 minutes ahead. <laughs> yeah, like um, I couldn't carry anything. I had to give it all to my cousin and say, oh, yeah. here, can you can you carry for this for me, please? And do this and yada, yada, yada. Um, if you know you're going to be in a caution that's going to get a lot of attention, make sure you have somebody with you that could essentially be your um, slave, Sherpa, dog's body. <laughs> you know, for the day that doesn't mind, you know, preferably you blackmail a family member into doing that, guys. You know, just say, hey, you're my family member, you love me, you're going to do this. Yeah, no, we, uh, whenever I go to a convention, I try to, uh, I, I try to do any shopping or, or th where I'm going to have to be carrying stuff around. I try to do that on a separate day from the day I know I'm going to be doing a costume that people are going to want photos in. That way, the day that I'm in that costume, I don't have an armload of things that I'm like, Ugh, here. Uh, so mm -hmm. it, something I, I, I find is easier, and, and that way I don't have to worry about, you know, if something breaking if I buy a statue or, or something wrinkling if I buy a poster. I think the two costumes that I've got planned for doing, one of them... I. I might be able to like slip my phone into a pocket or my wallet into one, but the other one, I can literally go around and buy stuff because the character has like a bag that is a part of the, the whole look. Yeah. So yeah. I think planning cosplays like that can be exceedingly smart and you're actually cheating the system in a sense of cosplay. Yeah. Um, but it also kind of gives you like a, a slap in the face because if a fan comes up to you of that character and says, oh, well, what do you have in your bag? You can't show them. Yeah. Oh, you know, just like, merchandise. <laughs> yeah, just swag. Just my swag. Yeah. <laughs> my free swag. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's... <laughs> um, let's talk about age differences in cosplay. So when I first started looking at cosplay um, seriously, I didn't necessarily know what to expect age range wise. I mean, I had a fair idea and anything I looked for cosplay was essentially coming from the States. Um, and anything I looked up cosplay wise, like there was, there seemed to be kind of like weird age groups to it. And I was like, okay, this is kind of interesting because it looks as if on one hand there's people who are um, early teens to mid-30s. And I thought, right, there's one age group. And then there was like families that were doing it, but they didn't look as if they were actually cosplaying to go to a convention. It looked like they were getting dressed up and going to fancy dress party. You know, or, or at least that was my assumption. Um... And I remember thinking, right, okay, the demographic must be that early teens to mid-30s thing. Mm -hmm. So that was, like, my concept going on. And I remember when I first went to that Comic-Con, there was so many different age groups there. There was mums, dads, aunts, uncles, grannies, granddads, children of all ages, you know. And it just blew my mind, you know. What was it like for you 
your first experience of a con, did you have a similar notion when it came to age groups and what was your initial reaction when you seen it was all across the board? Like age really wasn't a, a concern. Yeah, I mean, my my first introduction to any kind of comic convention uh, was very brief. Um, it was, I remember the day, only because it's the day that Skyrim was released, so it was November 11th, 2011, and I had gone and picked up the copy, and I, I got it home, I unboxed it, and then I said, okay, I have this ticket for Halcon, I guess I'll go there for a little bit and come home, because I was excited to play Skyrim. So I went, and I walked around what was then a very small vendor floor for a little bit. Um, I got a few pictures with with folks who, fast forward two or three years later, I'm now very good friends with, which is it's funny to look back on, because it's like, oh, that's an awesome costume, before I'd ever even thought of making one. And now I'm really good <laughs> friends with them. Um, but you're right, we had, you know, uh, somebody who's age-appropriate playing Gandalf. So there's an older person there. We've got young people dressed up as, uh, you know, children, six and seven, dressed up as Jedi. So it's, you know, it's everybody from a, a baby being carried around with Yoda ears to somebody who's age appropriate to play Gandalf. It's, it's, it's great. It's it, cosplay really is for everybody. Awesome. Um, you mentioned there somebody who's age appropriate to play somebody like Gandalf. Do you think that that is, is is something that should be looked at in cosplay or do you just tend to think no it doesn't matter what age you are you can be whoever you want to be oh no it doesn't matter at all definitely makes it easier if you're if you're the right age you don't have to you don't have to find a beard you don't have to gray up your hair um is, is that something that you do when you look at your cosplays you do you go right well i'm not the right age to play um like say future Bruce Wayne, but I'm the right age to play maybe Terry McGinnis. Um, I, I, some, a little bit. Um, I do, I do take that into consideration. Um, only because what I do, I'm in the general pub public a lot and there, uh, some of them, unfortunately, are a little bit less understanding. So I get a lot of, um, you'd make a better super boy. And it's like, well, yeah, give me a few years, but you, you know, it's, <laughs> Um, so it's, yes, I, I take that into consideration a little bit, but I don't let it stop me. Um, I'm probably 15 years to 17 years too young to be playing the Witcher, but you know, I just, I, I grayed up my beard and I, I added some wrinkles and I loved every minute of it. So, and I would absolutely consider doing, um, my own Gandalf or, um, even playing a younger character, like. You know, I might be almost thirty, but absolutely, I'll do Ash Ketchum. You know, it's it's not uh, it, the thing about cosplay, which I love, is that there's no such thing as not being able to do a costume um, based on any kind of a limit. If you want to do it, because in your heart of hearts you know that you can make that character great and you can make it your own, go for it. No one's going to stop you, and nobody should judge you for it. Is there certain things, um, like, there are certain characters that I think are, like, questionable for certain age groups? Like, for instance, we spoke earlier about the Margot Robbie version of Harley Quinn. Um, I know somebody whose daughter actually cosplays and she makes her own costumes herself and she's like really really young um, mm -hmm. and I remember speaking to her about it, about it and I was like are you going to let your daughter do the Margot Robbie version of Harley Quinn and she's like no and I was like okay um, is there any like has your daughter asked about that and she's like yes and we refer to that Harley as the underpants Harley and she's not allowed to do that until she's of a certain age, preferably when she's not living at home. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, yep, totally understand that. Yeah, yeah, there are, there are situations like that, obviously. But again, there's there's ways around them. You know, it's you do that version, but you're wearing leggings instead. It's yeah. the, there there's definitely ways around it. But I agree. Um, if if I had a daughter and she was you know seven years old, she definitely wouldn't be doing. Uh, poison ivy with just a few leaves covering her. You know what I mean? It's, it's 
Yeah. Um, I always all think like I always find it fun looking at people who do gender bent versions of characters. Like I always loved seeing a female Joker or a male Harley or, and and I think that's what inspired me to do Harley her, herself because a lot of people say um, that I'm quite a bubbly person, and mm-hmm. Harley has that bubbly aspect to her, but she also has that aspect where she's in love with the psychopath guys <laughs> you know I've never had the um, misfortune of being in love with the psychopath I may be a little bit psychopathic when it comes to DC but that's because I followed it for so many years <laughs> so yeah there <laughs> um so it's it's interesting the way that people make parallels against those characters. Like another set of people I know want me to do Hiccup from How to Train Your Dragon. And okay. the reason behind that is, and I think this is absolutely hilarious, and the people who have said this to me, you know who you are. Um, they've practically said I should really do Hiccup because A, we have a similar outlook on life, me and Hiccup. And B, he's very neurotic and I'm very neurotic. And I'm like, that's a good enough reason to do a cosplay. But Absolutely. it's also really difficult which like aspect of the character, well, what, what part of the character I choose. I would need to do the, the original look for Hiccup. Because I don't happen to have a missing leg, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would, be, that would be a whole different level of dedication. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving on. Let's talk about props. Um, the bane of every cosplayer's existence is props. So props fall into two categories for me and then three subcategories. It goes to a Comic-Con. It goes to a photo shoot. Comic-Con only, photo shoot only. The three subcategories are, holy crap, this prop is massively huge, it will break my back, and I have no fecking clue how to get it out of my house, let alone anywhere else. This prop is medium-sized, it's wonderful, it will start to annoy me after seven hours of carrying it around, but it's okay. And then lastly, this prop is so small it goes in my pocket and I'm good to go and it will not annoy me for the entire day. Obviously, all props are costume, like, allocated, but what props are you more inclined to take with you to a Comic-Con event? Or what kind of props? Um, I, I guess it would depend on the character, really. Um, it, things that I bring with me are going to be things that the character has and because of that they all tend to be part of the costume for me even though they might be created separately or they might be removable um props for me very much become part of the costume um so something like uh the witcher medallion well it's it's removable it's made out of real metal um so if i sprint around with it it's going to smack me in the face and hurt um, it's, so it's, it's very much, it, it's, it's absolutely, it's a prop cause I could have made it out of something else, but that becomes part of the character. So I, whether it's a photo shoot or, or to the convention, um, I, I make my, my costumes with the idea that if it's going to one, it's going to both. Only exception would be if it was like a real sword, which I can't bring to a convention, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, okay. So on the flip side to that, a lot of people tend to do three things Three things when it comes to their props. They buy them ready-made and ready to go. They buy them in kind of like half-made and maybe customize them a little just to get it the way they want it. Or B, they make it from scratch. And that way they know it's the way that they want it. Mm-hmm. Um, which out of those three are you more inclined to do, or would you do all three? Um, I will do, and I have done, 
um, all three, and I'll probably continue to do all three. Um, I'm not disillusioned. There are absolutely things that are not within my ability to do. Mm -hmm. Um, there are things that are not within my ability to start, but I can modify them. There's things that I don't want to do that I could do that I, (laughs) that I purchased, um, that was a lazy or a time thing. Um, and then there's stuff that I know. Yeah, absolutely. I can knock that out of the park. I'll, I'll do that myself. I'll save some money. I'll w- take a little bit more time, but it'll be something that I made. Um, so I, I, I pull from all three of those those different options. Awesome. Um, let's go on the making from scratch and possibly the buying them and buying it in and customizing it a little uh, side as well. Um, so when you're making a prop from scratch, do you go through the same cre- creation ugh, creation process that I'm praying that most other cosplayers like myself do? Um, I have an, a, a slight background in art. Like I do a lot of making things out of nothing and sketching and drawing and all the rest. And I remember when I made this guy from scratch and he's completely con friendly guys completely made out of cardboard and foam this guy drove me almost to insanity you know because parts of it just like the paint started to peel away in some parts and the the red bars that I have here were starting to like come away from the actual paint itself and I ended up talking to this prop like it was going to physically answer me back and cursing it, swearing at it, bargaining with it just to get it to work, you know, and it eventually did. So me and this prop are on good terms right now, <laughs> um, but I dare say there's going to be a point in time when you tick me off, Mr. Prop, but um, yeah, so completely con friendly everybody always wants to have a hold at it like I remember when I debuted this prop everybody was like oh my god I love your jack-in-the-box can I hold it can I touch it and I'm like you you can hold it with your eyes you can touch it with your eyes don't touch it physically please because it, it <laughs> drove me to insanity I don't want it breaking I want to use it again but I eventually was okay with some people holding it. I was like, yeah, you can, like, can you please hold this to, like, open it up so that I can take stuff out of it because it's practical. Um, so, yeah, any any props like this that almost drove you to insanity? Um, yeah, um, it's trying to figure out uh, uh, some things. I mean, I... I talk to myself or even, you know, sing to myself. Not that I can sing because I can't. I really cannot. Um, but, you know, it, it, while I'm doing something, just to keep my own sanity, um, I, I, you know, I'll sing at the sewing machine or I'll, I'll, I'll talk at whatever I'm making. Um, I know that uh, while I was making, I mean, it's, it's sort of a prop, uh, also a piece of the costume, but... I hold it sometimes because it's it's hard to see. And but um, my Mandalorian helmet. This is one that was it was half purchased and modified. Mm-hmm. Um, so it comes in a two part um, two part mold just from a website. So I had to fill in the cracks, sand it, um, and then recently I've remade the um, the cheeks because when they come they're they're curved. Uh, so I, I cut those out, flattened them, and then on the inside, um, I added an embroidery hoop to to uh, to expand it because it, when it comes, it's very narrow and it's it's less accurate that way. Um, but trying to get any kind of adhesive to get these to stick together, trying to get paint to stick to the smooth plastic, uh, was uh, more than a pain in the butt. Um, that's probably the fourth paint scheme it's had, and it probably won't be the last one. Have you bargained with that particular prop? Have you kind of like oh, asked it to please work? <laughs> oh yeah, when um, when I've got you know I've got clamps on on this, and I've got to wait for forty eight hours to see if it will stick, 
and the convention is in 72 hours, I'm, I'm absolutely, uh, you know, I'm doing everything but bribing this thing to make sure it's going to stay <laughs> together. It's, <laughs> um, I, I think bribery is the next thing. Like you go through various stages. Like I remember when making that particular Jack in the Box, I was thinking, right, uh, how far do I want to go with this Jack Jack in the Box? So I want it to look exactly like the real thing, like an actual Jack in the Box. Um, and how much of that can you achieve with like the materials that I made it from? You know. Um, and when certain parts of it just weren't working, I remember trying to bribe it and saying, look, you'll be the coolest prop on the, the, the show floor if you just bleeping work. Yeah, absolutely. People are going to love you, but you got to work. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't work and if you don't start behaving yourself, you're going to be flying out of my bedroom window in five minutes. Yeah. So you choose. Which one do you want? <laughs> yeah. Which one do you want? Do you want to be loved or thrown out of a window? Yeah, Choose exactly. Prop. <laughs> um, I think, I think the worst thing that's ever happened whenever I made a prop is I cursed it out in the middle of an art class. Like oh. I was sitting in the middle of my art class trying to make this prop work, and I just swore at it. I I, I was just like so in the moment kind of thing that I just kind of threw it down on the table and said, I've had enough of this effing prop. It can go <laughs> F itself, you effing piece of shit prop. Yep. Um, and I remember my, my tutor coming over and saying to me, are you okay? And I'm like, it's that effing prop. And he's like, you need to take a chill. Like, just yeah. go breathe. I will look at your prop and see where you're going wrong. Um, things like that. It's, yeah. it's I, I love it how people just come over and they're like, it's it's okay, you know. Oh, absolutely. We see you're having an issue. Um, does does your other half do that with you, or we is it, we is go it back somebody and else forth. that comes in and does yeah. that? Yeah, we we absolutely go back and forth. We uh, we both have our stress stressful periods um and we we both have to remind ourselves to take a step back we're doing it for fun if it doesn't work we've got other things we can wear we can always continue it later um and and very much each of us will step up and help the other one so if somebody's done um what they have to do for a certain event um then we'll we'll pitch in and we'll help out so i i i don't know uh, if there's well there, there's probably at least a small element on on each of my costumes that that they've had a hand in helping with. So, awesome. Um, is there any particular cosplays? Like I've seen a lot of your work, and I've seen a lot of your other halves work as well. Um, I haven't seen anything that you guys have done together just yet. Is there anything like that in the pipeline, or do you guys? Um, use... A lot of stuff we do. Um, we'll 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 find a mirror um in, in what they can do so we'll do um we'll do like the superman and the wonder woman uh we've each got a mandalorian we've done hawk girl and hawk woman uh or hawk girl and hawk man rather um just recently we did uh, we both did a character from the video game borderlands um i would say mo most things we do um so far uh beyond uh, I think the Witcher and when I did Witcher, she did Mass Effect, but even still they're both video game characters. Um, for the most part, we've done stuff that when we're standing beside each other in some way, it makes sense, whether it be Superman and Wonder Woman or, you know, what, what have you. Awesome. Uh, my next question for you is a really interesting one. Um, and it will probably give you an opportunity to speak about your charity work is what has cosplay opened up for you? away from being in costume? A lot, actually. Um, through uh, through what I do with 
the, the cosplay. Uh, not only have I met amazing people that have shared their stories of, of, of survival or, or overcoming cancer or, or those types of things, um, which are always very touching to hear. Um, I've also now, uh, more than ever, got such a fantastic close group of friends that I can count on for anything. Um, and through cosplay is where where I did meet uh, my other half. So we, we met through that. I was actually in costume as Captain America when we first met. Um, so I, I would say, except my professional life, like what I do for a, for a living money-wise, I would say pretty well every other aspect of my life I can, I can thank socially. I can thank now to do the cosplay stuff I've done and just some of the people that have, have uh, shared their stories and opened up to, not me specifically, but they've opened up to Superman and they've told him their stories. Um, it's going, it's go, great. Going on that, um, and I know that some of those stories can be very emotional and we won't delve into that because I don't want people crying <laughs> watching your interview. We're going to try and keep it lighthearted. What has been some of your most favorite interactions with fans of the characters that you've cosplayed as? And this can be from young children to mums, dads, aunts, uncles, whoever, you know. Absolutely. So let, let's start with a, a younger member. So like a young child, what has been one of your favorite interactions with a young kid? Um, I mean, almost weekly. I, I've got those with with kids. They'll um, anything from being too shy to even approach you, you know, hiding behind mom and dad's leg, um, to uh, you know, screaming up and down and running over and hugging you, and then and then proceeding for the next half hour to tell you all about the Lego game that they played and they they love playing as you, or the movie they watch with their their parents, and, and seeing them tell you about the experiences they've had with you as the character it's um and, and while you're staying in character obviously is it's it's that kind of connection that's going to stay with them forever and because of that it also is going to end up staying with me forever have you ever had um an interaction with a, a like a younger kid that you found it very difficult to stay in character and not from obviously um them telling you their story but just like an interaction where you were like oh it's really like oh i like you mentioned the kids hiding behind mum and dad's legs obviously you want to try and reach them in a way but you don't want to push that um mm -hmm. i would find that very difficult is there any kind of scenario where you've wanted to kind of try and slightly help that kid out but not wanted to push the boat really yeah, uh, it happens more often uh, when I would be Batman, um, not the armored one, but I had uh, one of the uh, the Arkham City cowls uh, made by Reeves FX, and it's got a very mean uh, scowl to it. So no matter what you do, you you look menacing to a child, and it, you can't push that because they will cry. It's much easier as Superman to bend down and be like, hey, buddy, can I have a high five or, or anything? And then sometimes, like, high five is very easy for a kid to understand. So, say four out of five times, they'll come up and they'll give you a high five. It's like, wow, man, you're really strong. When you grow up, you're going to be part of the Justice League. I can tell. Like, it's, it, you know, stuff like that is, it, it, it's, it's way easier when a kid can see your face uh, for them to be accepting. Uh, and, versus when you're in a helmet or you're in Batman. Um, and, and at that point, you have to realize when it's not going to work, you step back and you say, okay, if they want to come up to me, they can, but I'm not going to go towards them. Same thing uh, growing up, my parents, um, they bred and showed uh, German Shepherds um, mm -hmm. as a hobby. So I grew up with many dogs being around dogs, being around uh, happy dogs, scared dogs, timid dogs. And you... It's a very similar thing with, with young children, not to compare kids with animals, but um, you don't go at something that's scared. You offer an opening, and if they come to you, 
great, but you don't push it because there's always the chance that what you do could uh, affect them in a bad way. So it's, I, I don't push it. Um, it's easier as Superman. It's easier, but <laughs> I'm just reminded of the old adage: never work with animals and kids. But that's that's for something completely different, guys. That's nothing to do with cosplay. Um, all right. So we kind of spoke about kids there. What about older generations, like say maybe teenagers and adults? What what has been your most favorite interaction with one of them while you've been in character? Teenagers we don't find as much of because um, a lot of what we do is uh, children's events or um, or uh, like walks for awareness um, or at like a children's hospital. Well, this um, can be at a Comic Con as well. So like when you've had an interaction with somebody at an event where you're dressed as Superman and maybe a teenager or mum or dad has come up to you and went, oh my God, you're like, so amazing it's Clark Kent or it's Superman and you know you've tried to stay in character and you're like why does this person not realize that I'm someone in a costume no it's uh there's a lot of um oh my god you look just like him um the the thing that just as you said that uh struck out to me was actually last year when I did uh the Witcher cosplay um we were just finishing up a photo shoot outdoors um, and I was standing off to the side waiting for the other members who were in their photo shoot to wrap up so we could go get something to eat. And there was a lady who happened to be out on a, a smoke break or, or having a, a cigarette. And she, she came up to me and she had a very thick accent, but I could understand what she was saying. And she happened to be Polish. And the, the Witcher games are based on a series of Polish novels. Um, and so... She, because I get like the the Witcher in Poland is their big thing. They've got postage stamps of them. He's on their coins, things like that. Um, it's very much a part of of their thing. I mean, I I'm, I think for her that would have been similar to uh, you know an American seeing Superman. So she, while they were doing their photo shoot, photo, photo shoot, uh, she told me you know all of about reading the books as she was growing up and how much she loved them and, and all of this kind of stuff. And during that, there was no hope of staying in character because then at that point, we were both gushing fans. So, <laughs> um, I remember having a similar thing when I did L for the first time. Um, I didn't do L at um, a convention for the first time. I did him at a fancy dress party. And oh, cool. everybody that was at this fancy dress party was almost everybody was slightly older than me and I remember having just watched the live action like the original live action movies not the the Netflix one yep. um, and I watched a behind the scenes thing and they were saying in the behind the scenes thing that the actor who played L also wore a wig and he had to take moments when he took the wig off because it was so hot and he was in the sun a good portion of the time for the outdoor scenes that he's in. Um, and I felt the exact same because I was in a very enclosed space. I was wearing a wig and I was like, I need to go outside and get a breath of air. And I remember this girl coming up to me and she's like, um, I just wanted to say you are amazing in uh, Death Note and how your character, like how you died off, I felt was absolutely just terrible, but it was also a really great like piece of story writing. But oh, absolutely. Like Nier and Nello aren't really great. Like she, she turned to me and said, Nier and Nello are not good replacements for you and I was like you've only really watched the anime haven't you <laughs> um, so I love interactions like that and it is really difficult to stay in character because you just you want to sit and talk more of it with them yeah it, but you also kind of like think right how would the character respond to that mm -hmm. and if you're caught off guard by it, by like those scenarios, you're caught off guard. So it is very difficult to go, just kind of like think, right, I'm in character. 
how do I respond to this? Yes. You just can't. Yep. Um, all right. So um, my next question for you is what are your next three cosplays? So to break this down, who you're going to be at your next event, somebody that you're working on that we might see, well, somebody that you're working on that we're going to see um, middle of this year, and then somebody that you're thinking about that we could see towards the end of this year or the beginning of next year. So let's start with who you're going to be at your next event. Uh, well, since we do weekly events, um, I mean, I'm going to be Superman in probably four days. <laughs> we Yay! have, uh, yeah, we have an event with, uh, with the wish kids, um, at a, a small theme park type area and, uh, and they go every year and we, we show up as, as our group of heroes and, 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 and cosplayers. Um, so I'll be Superman for that. Um, and then probably the week, uh, maybe the weekend after. I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Uh, who is somebody that you're working on that we might see you as somewhere middle of this year? Well, there is something I'm working on. Uh, it's part of a group, and we're we're keeping that one a secret until it's revealed. Um, but you'll see more about that probably end of October is when that one will be coming out. All right, so we will get social media links in a moment, guys, so you can keep an eye on what Matt's up to with that. So lastly, who is somebody that you're thinking of that we might see end of this year or the beginning of next year? So someone you're thinking about or something that you're thinking yeah, about. Yeah, someone I'm thinking about doing, um, it probably will end up being closer to spring of next year, but it would probably be the next costume I would work on would be uh, Goku from Dragon Ball. Awesome. Dragon Ball Z. I can totally see you as Goku. It's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun and very comfortable, so I'm super excited for that. It's uh, that one all hinges on on the wig. I've got a few leads on on what I want to do for that. So once I get that, then the rest of it is just sewing, and that'll be that'll be no problem. Yeah, I can either see you as Goku or Gohan. Mm -hmm. I've done I've done Gohan before. Um, I think, I think still, if you it, actually, sorry, I guess, well, that, that one was a Halloween costume, uh, that I did while I was in high school. Um, but for whatever reason, I, all I did was post it on my DeviantArt way back when that was still a thing. DeviantArt is a thing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, technically, uh, technically think, it still kind of is, but I don't think anyone yeah, it, it. It's still around. Uh, it's just not a thing in my life, I guess. Um. But I think even still to this day, if you type in Google um, adult Gohan cosplay, I'll be like the 12th or something hit down uh, just in his like blue, uh, blue gi that he was, he was using while he was training with Videl. Um, awesome. Yeah. And so that was, that was pretty cool. All right. So my last question for you before we get to all the stuff that we need to do is what advice would you give to somebody who is new to cosplaying but doesn't necessarily know where to start? Um, honestly, uh, YouTube. Uh, if, if you know a character you want to do, there's probably a tutorial or a how-to or a template file or something you can find. Um, and if not, there's something similar that you can use. And uh, if you know people, reach out to them for help. I know a lot of people uh, don't think that they want to ask for help or they want to do it themselves, but um, cosplay is is an art form. It's a way of expressing yourself, and people are more than happy to share that with other people. So you'll be surprised with the amount of help you'll find. I'm I'm just gonna add to that and say, guys, as far as cosplay is concerned, cosplayers are the worst people for keeping secrets, like. We can't keep secrets to save our own life when it comes to how we made a costume. We will literally sit and tell you the intricate details of every single piece of costume we have. Absolutely. It's, it's unavoidable. You know? Yeah. I, We're very I, proud I, of what we've made. Yeah. I, I have to admit, sometimes I dread asking somebody how they made something because I know that there's going to be a big massive long explanation um, and I hate things like that but that being said I have to be and pasted a few answers because the amount of 
where did you get your Superman suit from messages I get a day are are astronomical. So I have a few copy and pasted paragraphs. I will admit to that, that I send to people. And then if, uh, if they need more information, I'll go into a bit more personal and I'll type them up something. But Awesome. Yeah. So I'm just going to jump in here before we get to the Passover for Matt and see if you have any questions for either myself or Matt. There is a, oh, like, do you see it, Matt? There's like a comment section. Just, just down there. Yeah. Right like, down right there. there. Yeah. Um, you can put in a question to either myself or Matt and we will do our very best to answer said question. Also, don't forget to give me and Matt a big thumbs up because we like our thumbs. And if by chance you want to see more cosplay interviews, go and check out my playlist, guys, where I have multiple costume, uh, well, multiple interviews with many different cosplayers. People like uh, Elizabeth Rage and her boyfriend Alex. Cause the Commotion Cosplay, the amazing couple of Dean and Shalina, um, Chris Villain, Titan Cosplay, Kovi Kex, Alpha Betty, Tina Fell, Little Rascal, and many, many more cosplayers. Like, there's over, at this point in time, guys, 93 interviews. So go and check a good portion of them out. However, if you, cosplay is not exactly your thing, um, I do have some gaming videos that you can go and check out. And if you want more from me for some strange reason, you can find me on this amazing website called iGameOnline.net where we do have a Facebook page as well as a YouTube page where we have amazing shows and many other different things. And you can actually con well catch up with some of our resident cosplayers and uh, Tinafel, Alpha Betty, Little Rascal, and Kobe Kicks. However, if you have a burning question that you just want to ask Matt and you don't necessarily want to put it in that comment section down there, why the hell not? Matt is going to give us some amazing links now that we can actually keep up with him and maybe send him a question or two. So Matt, where can we get hold of you if we have any further questions? Yeah, you bet. Uh, easiest places to find me are going to be uh, www.facebook.com slash Matt O'Coin official uh, or on Instagram at Matt dash O'Coin uh, or underscore underscore, underscore. Matt underscore, O'Coin. underscore. Yeah. One's my Snapchat. One is my Instagram. Feel free to follow both. I don't have anything to hide. <laughs> awesome. So, guys, with that being said, don't worry if you miss any of those um, social media links. They will be in the description of this video, so go in there and go and follow Matt on all of his social medias because he's an absolutely amazing cosplayer. Like, go Thanks. check out his cosplays. And, well, I hate to say it, but that's all the time we have for on this episode of Inside Cosplay. Uh, please join me, guys, in thanking Matt for taking the time out and spending it with us and talking all things cosplay with us. In the meantime, I've been Jai452, Matt has been Matt, and this has been Inside Cosplay, and we will be back with another interview, guys, really soon. Bye, guys.